All right, let's just jump right into it. So, uh, like you said, this was a class that we taught. Um, it was four undergrads. We did a seminar, and we went through this whole effort and came up with this product at the end. And it's an entire semester's worth of stuff that I'm doing in six minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> so uh, get ready, buckle up. I'm going to talk super fast. <laughs> OK, let's get at that. So I spent a lot of time thinking about the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the age of man. Just like the whole the Pleistocene, when glaciers came and reshaped all the geomorphology and the plants and animals reassociated, that was the Ice Age. And then after that was the Modern Age. And then humans came along and they reshaped everything and plants and animals reshaped them, they reassociated themselves, and that started the Anthropocene. They think it started in around 1950, mid, mid part of the last century. But some people say it started all the way back to the beginning of humans, right at the the, uh, about 8,000 years ago, as the, as the population increased, so did our agricultural practices and cut down trees and burned wood, and we changed the atmosphere as, as we grew in population. So I think about that stuff today, like what happens when we put together climate change and land use change, and I spent a lot of time looking at satellite images, which I can look back to about 1975. Before that, I look at aerial images, which takes me back to about World War One, World War Two. and before that, I gotta look at at uh, photographs, but before that, what do I do? And I said, well, we can look at landscape paintings. How about that? Look at this great painting, the, the Oxbow. Over on the right side, there's a whole mess of, of agricultural practices and logging and all sorts of other things, and over here is not not that as a change. And I was like, that that says it right there. They 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 do stuff right to the edge, and I, and I took this idea to, to some um, Art historians, and they're like, no, that's crazy, man. You can't do that. That's a totally against the rules. This this painting is super complex. Over on the left side, we have the sublime nature of wilderness. That's the that's the exciting, dangerous part of wilderness that brings us towards this this uh, wonderful sense of adventure. But over on the right side is our manifest destiny. You can see fairies moving over there, and the, and the umbrellas pointing that direction, and there's there's trains heading that direction. And and back in the, that clear-cut area, if you see that from God's perspective, it's the Hebrew word of God, and that's that's where we're supposed to be going. They're like, haven't you, don't you know anything about art history? Haven't you read Panofsky's Iconology? And I'm like, no, I have no idea what that is. So we opened that up. Oh, and he said, oh, here's the here's the artist staring back at us, asking us who we are. There's This is full of symbols, but it's it starts with the form, and then it has all sorts of stories on top of that, and, um, and from that we can get some kind of idea of, of symbology, right? So let's take a look at this iconology and what that means. There's the three steps, the form, the stories, and the symbology. Let's start with the form, a couple of naked people, and uh, <laughs> the person on the right is holding this cornucopia, and the person on the left is holding a bunch of paper. It turns out the one on the right is fortune, one on the left is luck. Luck's got his toe jammed in there bubble that she's sitting on, and she's going to drop it right there, because that's, that's how it works. That's the story behind it. Okay, well, let's just look at the form itself. Right? Let's look at what the basis of this is. So here's Monet looking at stuff that he sees along this beach, and that's his painting. Okay, so from the painting, there's this artistic license. There's this gauze that the artist looks over, just re irregardless of the symbolism. So let's look closer at that form. That's the thing. So here's Christina's world. This is Andrew Wyeth's neighbor. He lives. He's looking out his window, seeing his his uh, neighbor Christina, who's who's uh, paralyzed. And that grass area is the place that she could crawl, but she could crawl out of that and look back on her world. That makes it a really powerful image. That is what he saw, and he put the story on top of that. So okay, let's look at the farm again. So we're going to look at the uh, Oxbow here and a photo of 1900, and then the paintings at 1836. So there's the there's the real thing. That's what. Thomas Cole saw, and he put a little bit of his artistic license and told that story of Manifest Destiny and the Sublime, yada yada, on top of that. But what I'm interested in is the form behind it. So here we, let's let's separate the stories and the, and the allegories and the symbolism from the form behind it. There's our friend Fortune again, holding her stuff. There's a broken bottle. We, can, we peel that away, and what we see behind it is agricultural practices in 1900. Wall to wall, no, no habitat, all sorts of plowing, that's the thing I'm interested in seeing. So let's, how do we link science and uh, art together? So this is what we're doing this weekend, cleaning our eaves. If we don't clean our eaves, they'll all start to rot, and then they'll form this primary conditions. And then if we don't clean that, we get annual plants. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. Here's the problem. If you don't clean that out, it turns into perennial plants with some roots in it, and we'll start to tear apart our roof 
and then shade intolerant trees will grow on it, and eventually sage tolerant trees, and your house will turn into an archaeological, you know, antiquated piece of relic. Now, that's something that we can see in our own home and around us, but let's go back to the art. So here's Thomas Cole and some other folks painting the Colosseum, and we can see that same process, the same ecological process occurring and captured by these artists. A botanist went and did a survey of, that, of the Colosseum in 1850, found 420 different plants growing on that thing. Uh, since then, they've all been cleaned out for to you know make it into the tourist trap that it is today. But so if we if we look at um, now, let's put these two together. Let's put the science and the art together. Uh, we have this palace in um, 1750s, and they they manipulated the river and changed it around. There's the same palace and the same river, and you see the same change. It's super hard to find paintings in the exact same place. That's really hard to do, but we can see this. This could be anywhere in Montana or anywhere in the East Coast. We've got cows and rivers and impoundments behind that. That happens today. My neighbor over in the Jefferson River said, you know, I don't know what you people talk about cows affecting rivers. Those cows have been in that river for 100 years. It hasn't changed a bit. It's true, but 101 years ago, it looked different. So, um, that, and that's what they caught there. Here in this this uh, climate change. This is a this is a painting of the of the Thames Frost Fair in the, in the 1600s, and the last time the Thames froze enough for people to go on it and have a big party was 1820. So this was capturing something that is lost to us in these paintings. And if we look at this one here, we see all the way back to the 1560s. This is agricultural practice. You can see this little critter hiding in the hiding in the bushes here and a couple of other birds, but all the habitat has been gone. That habitat's been gone since 1500s, right? This is the kind of influence that humans have had in the landscape, and we go back in hundreds. But hundreds of years, but one thing we also have to remember that sometimes art's just a giant blue chicken, right? And we, we can't try to make it any more than just, we just gotta let it be a giant blue chicken, because it's fun, like art's, art's fun. But it also means that you can dig into art and find meaning that you find specifically interesting. And that's, that was what the wonderful part of this journey is, is discovering that art is for all of us, no matter what our interests are. Thank you very much.